Okay, so now we will be talking about axions in the early universe and the axion relic density. I'm going to do about half of the uh, relic density now, and then we'll discuss uh, the and then, and then we will discuss the second half of the relic density tomorrow morning. Okay, so axions in the early universe. Uh, here's a bit of selected reading. Uh, Colbin Turner, Sakivi's review, and uh, my review. The first thing we need to think about how to get axions in the early universe, we've already talked about a little of this earlier. We have petroquin symmetry breaking, which occurs when the temperature of the universe drops below the symmetry breaking scale. We have shift symmetry breaking when the instanton effects turn on, which is around the QCD scale for the QCD axion, but for an axion like particle is around some scale that I'm calling mu here. And then we have axion field evolution when the Hubble constant uh, drops to around up the mass. And I'll explain why that is very shortly. Uh, the first question we should ask is when and how are initial conditions set? And the second question we should ask is what produces relic axions? So sources of cosmic axions. There are two possible sources. There is the classical axion condensate which is the evolution of the classical field. And there is thermal production um, and non-thermal decays, which, which, produce part, which produce hot axion particles. So we write this in this way. Phi is the classical axion field. It has a large occupation number, so we're just interested in the evolution of the classical field. And then this is production of axions from, say, annihilation, thermal production from the standard model or decay of some heavy, of some heavy particle. In the case of the evolution of the condensate, which is what I will focus on in this lecture, we need to consider the case of spontaneous symmetry. We need to ask when the spontaneous symmetry breaking happens. Does it happen after inflation or does it happen before or during inflation? In the case that it happens after inflation, axion, we have axion dark matter production from topological defects, um, such as axion strings and domain walls, which we'll come up tomorrow morning. And we have the, the prevalence of these objects called axion mini clusters. If spontaneous symmetry breaking happens before or during inflation, all we have to worry about is the evolution of the axion mean field when we're thinking about the relic density. But we also have to think about the quantum fluctuations of the axion field imprinted during inflation, which, which manifests as isocurvature perturbations. In the other case where we're making uh, hot axions, we have relativistic particles. Uh, in that case, we can have contributions of axions either to the hot dark matter or to the dark radiation. And I won't be discussing those today. Today, I'm just going to be discussing the, the, these two here. And in fact, in, the, in this half hour now, we will just discuss the mean field evolution of the axiom. For the quantum fluctuations case, um, some, of this will be, some of this will be covered in Vivian Poulin's lecture when isocurvature is discussed. Okay, so I divide this um, according to Sakivi's nomenclature into, into scenario A and scenario B. Scenario A is when the Petroquin symmetry is broken after inflation, and scenario B is when it is broken during inflation. So, scenario A, we have this picture. So, we have the, the axion field here, inflation. Um, infl inflates our field to be an entire Hubble patch, but then spontaneous symmetry breaking happens and different Hubble patches pick different values of theta. And the current Hubble patch encompasses many different values of theta. This is what we can see here. So at the end of it, so we have the end of inflation, the reheat temperature is high enough that the petroquin symmetry is restored. And then we have random values for theta um, in many different patches in our universe. Whereas in scenario B, the petroquin symmetry, the, the, temp the maximum temperature of the universe is not high enough such that the petroquin symmetry um, is broken. Because remember, inflation is a very cold thing. So really, when we say broken after inflation, we mean restored and then broken again. Um, inflation is very cold. Um, in this case, the temperature of the universe was never high enough to restore the Petroquin symmetry. 
So our entire universe is encompassed by a single patch of the axion angle. So when symmetry breaking happens, it's like a pencil falling over, a random value for the axion field is picked, and inflation makes that smooth over our whole, whole horizon. So now we need to ask, how does the axion field evolve? And it's that initial, that initial value gives us our classical cold condensate for the same reason that all other perturbations are squeezed during inflation. So we have to ask how that, how that classical field evolves. So we have the scalar field action here with a canonical kinetic term in curved space. Here it is, here's the scalar field derivatives and here's the potential. We apply the Euler-Lagrange equations and we get the equations of motion for our field. And that's just the Klein-Gordon equation. Well, box is a Dallin version and it's now evaluated on curved space. So you have to be careful about the metric determinants and the inverse metric. In FRW, this leads to box taking the following form, minus dt squared minus 3hdt plus Nabla squared. For FRW, we should strictly ignore uh, Nabla squared, and we will, but we will include it um, approximately when curvature is small. And of course, if you want to talk about the gravitational growth of structure, you need to also include metric perturbations into the evaluation of box. So now we need to work out the axial energy momentum tensor. And for that, we have the, I, we have the einstein hilbert action. And we know that the Euler-Lagrange equations give us the Einstein field equations. And the right-hand side of those is the energy momentum tensor, which is then defined as the functional derivative of the matter action with respect to the metric. And the components of the energy momentum tensor define the energy density, pressure, and velocity perturbations of the fluid in the following way. Sigma IJ is, is an anisotropic stress. This defines the energy momentum tensor of a scalar field. So from our matter Lagrangian before, we can take the variation with respect to the metric. And it takes this, this form. In FRW, only the energy density and pressure are non-vanishing. So when the metric has um, the maximum symmetric Friedman form, then the energy density is phi dot squared plus phi and the pressure is phi dot squared minus phi. So this is um, now what we have to evaluate to find out what the dark matter relic density is. What that means is it means compute the final value of the energy density given the initial conditions for the Klein-Gordon equation. So we take some initial conditions at some time ti and we work out the energy density at the final time t0. Then the cosmic density parameter is defined as omega a h squared is rho times h squared over 3 h naught squared m Planck squared. And you notice that that removes the dependence on this little h. This is a physical density parameter. It doesn't depend on what the Hubble parameter is. That's why we use it in this way rather than omega. And for cold dark matter, we know from the cosmic microwave background that omega a h squared should be 0.120 plus or minus 0.001. And so our task then is to compute this function, rho of t0, given everything that we know about the axion. So given an initial field value, possible initial time derivative, axion mass, and any other parameters that are relevant to the evolution. So what I'm going to tell you about in, the, in this first part of this lecture is scenario B, because it's the simplest one where we can compute um, pretty much everything. And so here's a couple of references, which you'll find useful. So the Klein-Gordon equation. Inflation smooths the background field. So, let's, so in scenario B, we can just neglect spatial derivatives of the field completely. And for the QCD axion, this is the form that the Klein-Gordon equation now takes. So what I want you to notice is that this is the form of a general damped anharmonic oscillator. Where the, where the Hubble term plays the role of the damping coefficient, which falls over time. So you can have the field transitioning from overdamped to underdamped motion. And it's an anharmonic oscillator. Remember that this potential here is the um, cosine potential for the dilute instant on gas. And for the QCD axiom, we have a temperature dependent mass 
given by the temperature dependence of the QCD topological susceptibility. Key feature is that the mass is rising and the Hubble constant is falling. So we transition so as a, when those, when those, when these two terms are equal to each other, when Hubble is equal to the mass, assuming that the time derivatives are of order, uh, are of order Hubble, or, uh, then the Hubble friction will dominate until the time when Hubble is equal to the mass. And then after that point, the field unfreezes and begins to oscillate. So, but at early times when the Hubble constant is very large, the field can't move, it's overdamped, and we say it's frozen. And so the so we can take the initial condition that phi dot at early times is very small and we neglect it. Yeah, and okay. For the for the cosine potential, this is the equation of motion of a circular circular pendulum on a on a plane with friction and a time-dependent angle of inclination. Let's start with the simplest version of this equation, which has an exact solution, but to, and displays all of the key features. So first simplification is let's take a T-independent mass. So let's talk about axion-like particles, T-independent mass. And for the QCD axion, this is relevant um, if F is very large, actually. And let's also assume no back reaction. Let's um, just compute the evolution of the axion field on a fixed um, space-time background. So a fixed um, Hubble um, evolution of, uh, of, of Hubble. And this is relevant for axion dark matter when the transition from when, when Hubble drops below the mass occurs in the radiation dominated epoch where the axions themselves are not affecting the um, evolution of the background space-time. Uh, this is this assumption can't be used in the case of, for example, axion inflation or axion dark energy. And finally, let's assume that we have a harmonic potential, which will be re which is reasonable if the initial displacement in the potential is less than one. So close to the, so sufficiently close to the minimum of the potential. Uh, the assumption two means that we can assume that the background um, evolution of the scale factor is given by simply a power law. Let's just assume a radiation background. So we have a, a of t goes like t to the p. And with all these assumptions, you can write down this exact solution uh, to the damped to the to the damped Klein Gordon equation. So it's written in terms of Bessel functions. And the order of the Bessel function is determined by the time evolution of the background. And we have that the field has a, a time dependent decay and then a decay also given by the by a power of the scale factor. And the constants C1 and C2 here are set by the initial conditions um, such that the field velocity is zero at early times and we have some constant initial value. And the initial value of phi um, has been scaled out here in the harmonic, in the harmonic equation, this is linear. The asymptotic behavior is that at early times, the fields are constant, given by its initial value. And at late times, you can expand the, you can expand the Bessel functions. You can see that at late time, and then a t to the half cancels this t, t to the minus half cancels this t to the half here. And the field is just an, a harmonic oscillator decaying with a power a to the minus three halves. So let's look at what that means in this solution. So here's the axiom field phi evolving as a function of scale factor. It's overdamped and then it begins to oscillate with the decaying envelope. This beginning of oscillations occurs when Hubble, which is dropping like a power law, crosses the value of our constant mass. The equation of state, which is the ratio of the pressure to the energy density, is minus one when the energy like behaving like a cosmological constant or vacuum energy when the field is damped, when it's not evolving, and then it begins to oscillate and oscillates around zero, which is the equation of state of pressureless matter. And indeed, the energy density, which is in the fourth panel here, begins as a constant and then transitions at this time to scale like a to the power minus three. 
And that is because the envelope of the field is decaying like a to the minus three halves. And we have phi dot squared plus n squared phi squared, cos squared plus sine squared equals one, and the energy density decays like a to the minus three at late times. So we have something that behaves like pressureless dust and particles coming out of the evolution of a classical field. A classical field with m squared phi squared potential, if it's oscillating around potential in an expanding universe, it behaves like pressureless matter. If the potential was something different, if there was no mass term and it was lambda phi to the four, then this would scale like a to the minus four. So the evolution in the potential matters. And for the axion, what matters is that the potential is quadratic about its minimum, that the particle has a mass. And that we got this initial displacement of the field away from its minimum by spontaneous symmetry breaking. Spontaneous symmetry breaking occurs at a time when the axion mass is not relevant. So any value of theta could be picked. And then when the mass switches on, the field realigns, we call this vacuum realignment or vacuum misalignment. And it's this realignment of the field around its minimum that gives the energy density in the form of a classical field condensate. As a useful approximation to try and estimate what this relic density is. So the, the energy density at the value of the scale factor when oscillations begin, which I call a os, is approximately the value of the energy density at the initial time, as you can see here. And that, in, in our approximation here, is half m squared phi squared. The transition scale occurs approximately when 3h is equal to m. At early times, the field behaves like dark energy. But remember, we're neglecting its back reaction here. And at late times, the field behaves like dark matter. And the energy density just scales like the cube of the scale factor from the time when the oscillations begin. Now, picking this number here, 3h equals m, has to be done so that you match the numerical results. Um, in the example on the slide here, um, a, a 2h would have been the best pick, um, but in most practical applications, um, 3h is a, is a better approximation. And now we can get a closed form expression for the, for the relic density, for this axion-like particle case, this simple case. The most interesting one for axion dark matter uh, the two bottom cases are for ultralight axions, which again will be the subject of Vivian Poulin's lecture. For axion dark matter, the top approximation is best when the transition to matter-like behavior, A OSC, occurs before matter radiation of quality. If you're, if you're going to be dark matter, the you should be behaving like matter at matter radiation of quality. Um, so for dark matter axions, this is the most useful approximation. And you can just plot that and have a look at some interesting scales for these axion-like particles. So I, so I can displace my field by some initial value, which I'm measuring in um, GeV, and then look at the relic density as a function of the mass. If you're above this line, you have too much dark matter. And if you're on this line here, you have the right dark matter relic density. And for this type of axion-like particle, I want you to note that if we pick an initial field value at the gut scale, this initial field value is, just, is close to the spontaneous symmetry breaking scale, then you get the right relic abundance of dark matter in a range of masses between about 10 to the minus 15 EV and about 10 to the minus 22 EV. However, there's a note of caution there. We shouldn't forget the quantum fluctuations, um, although I don't have time to, to go into that right now. Important lessons. Axions behave like dark matter when, whenever the Hubble constant is less than the mass, and behave like dark energy when the Hubble constant is greater than the mass. I don't have time to go into the uh, details of axion dark energy or inflation. What about axion dark matter? Let's have a look at the scales. We want to consider the, the Hubble scale at different epochs to try and nail what the mass scales are. If the, the Hubble scale is about 10 to minus 15 EV at BBN, so for the QCD axion, oscillations are occurring 
before BBN. If you put in with the K constant at, at the Planck scale, look at our formula from the math, the math from the last lecture, the TCDX zone is heavier than 10 to minus 15 EV. And it begins oscillating before BBN. So actually the thermal history of the universe at that time is not certain. And that's why inflation can play an important role. The Hubble constant today is 10 to minus 33 electron volts. So an actually unlike particle lighter than that behaves like dark energy. Everything in between, we can nail some scales and some of these constraints um, and scales will, again, I believe we talked about in Vivian's lecture. What I want to say in the last five minutes of this lecture is how we have to compute the relic density for the TCD axiom. So none of our simplifying assumptions from the nice example I just gave with the exact solution, none of those simplifying assumptions hold for the QCD axiom, unfortunately. Which ones do we have to revoke? Well, before BBN, we have to worry about, as I said, the thermal history of the universe. So we cannot treat the Friedman equation as just a simple fluid. We have to worry about the evolution of the number of relativistic degrees of freedom, i.e. G star, in particular, how it evolves during the QCD phase transition. The temperature dependence of the mass is important. The topological susceptibility is switching on around the time when the field begins to oscillate. H is of order M while M is still evolving and the potential can be unharmonic. Furthermore, there's this potentially important issue of the contribution of quantum fluctuations to the initial condition. So, yeah, we covered all of these points, apart from the last one, in this morning's lecture. So let's just look at them quickly. So first of all, there's G-star. This nice lattice paper that computes ca ca um, the topological susceptibility also gives a lattice computation of G star. To find a tabulated value for it. You need to put this into your calculation. We need to put in the correct temperature evolution of the mass, which we already saw this morning. We need to put in the correct potential, which we saw this morning. And now let's try and estimate the relative density. So we take, we need to estimate the, the temperature when the three times the Hubble constant is equal to the mass. We just write down the Friedman equation in terms of the temperature, write down the mass in terms of the temperature and rearrange. So we write down the mass as the zero temperature mass scaled with the power law and the Friedman equation including G star Approximating G star as a series of step functions, we can work out that the oscillation temperature has the following scaling with the decay constant controlled by N, where N is the power law of the mass evolution, minus four in the dilute instant on gas. Due to the mass evolution, we, we can't just use this approximation that the energy density scales like a to the minus three after oscillations begin, we have to be slightly more careful. We have to look for an adiabatic invariant. Since the mass evolution is slow compared to the change in the frequency, there is an invariant of this oscillation. And what's actually conserved is a number density. So the number density scales like a to the minus three and then we have to account for the temperature evolution of the mass separately. So what that means is we can take the, en the, the energy density at a given temperature is equal to the number density when the oscillations began, scaled, and then scale this part with the scale factor and multiply back by the mass um, at the later time. And then we can use entropy con conservation to compute the ratio of scale factors in terms of, again, G star, the relativistic degrees of freedom and the temperature. And we find finally that the energy density, everything now 
is determined by the the k constant and the initial and the initial field value factors out in the harmonic approximation and has this scaling with power laws of f. Okay, so strictly, this is only when the potential is in its harmonic regime, which brings me to the last point, which is there should be an anharmonic correction. So the so there is, so the energy density depends on the initial field value, and we can write this as the value that we would get in the harmonic potential times a correction factor that you can compute once. When the initial field value is small, the anharmonic correction should be small. So this should asymptote in one. But if the initial field value is such that the field sits on the top of its potential, then it will, ne then it will never fall off. And so in the limit that theta goes to pi, this function has to diverge. And you can show that the, the divergence actually has to be logarithmic. So there are approximations for how this happens. And this is our final plot of this quick introduction to the relic density. The I'm contour plotting a fit function for everything that I've just told you about, which the, the particular fit I'm plotting you can find from in Fox et al, but there are a number of others. And here is the contour plot of the axion relic density in terms of log of the initial field value and log of the decay constant. Along this line, you have the right dark matter relic density. And nature doesn't tell us what the initial field value should be or what the decay constant is. So, there are two, so these are two free parameters in this scenario B. If you set theta equals one, then correct relic density is obtained for a decay constant around 10 to the 11 GeV, 10, a few times 10 to the 11 GeV. If you look back at the formula for the mass given in the last lecture, that's a mass of about 10 micro EV, you know, 10 to 50 micro EV. However, there are you can set the field value to be smaller and have the correct relic density at um, larger values of the decay constant, smaller axion masses. Even taking the decay constant all the way up to the, the Planck scale only requires a fine tuning on the initial misalignment angle of a few times 10 to the minus four. That's still a lot better than the strong CP problem. And you can also get heavier axions, smaller decay constants, if you take the initial field value up towards pi. So that's the end of what I want to say about scenario A. And tomorrow morning, well, morning my time, uh, afternoon your time, tomorrow we will talk about scenario B and how to search for action dark matter. So I'm happy Thanks. now yeah. to take a few questions. Yeah, we have a few questions. Can I can you ask? Yeah. 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 So the first one is uh, uh, are we assuming here that the case for PQ symmetry breaking during inflation, the patch of the universe where the theta takes a certain value, is it large enough so it can cover the observed universe today? Yes. Right. So if the, so if the symmetry is broken during inflation, then there are 60 E folds of inflation to solve the horizon and flatness problems. And that means that the the, 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 the current the, the current universe is entirely one uh, one patch. Now, if inflation was just sixty e folds, and um, then of course modes could be entering the horizon now, which are corresponding to the very beginning of inflation, and then that could be some inhomogeneities in large scale inhomogeneities in theta. Um, but jet, but in, but with sixty e folds of inflation, if your symmetry is broken during inflation, you always get a completely uniform field in this scenario. Great. So the next question we have is, in gravity theory, one could have axion fields coming with CP violation terms that could be added to Lagrangian. Some special theory called gravitational pontryctin. Is there a compelling reason why they must 
be or need not be considered as well? Um, yeah. So there, so there are um, contributions to the axion potential that can occur from uh, gravitational instantons, if that's part of the part of the question. So, um, so yeah, for example, you can have a, a CP violating uh, like wormhole instanton, which would contribute to the axion potential. Um, if it's the um, for, for an axion coming from like string theory, these instantons are very important because they can be the leading contribution for the to the mass. For the QCD axion, any other um, source of the potential um, will shift the minimum away from, well, yeah, if it's another CP violating term, will shift the minimum away from zero and can spoil the solution to the strong CP problem. So for the QCD axion, um, indeed, you have to check that these, that, that these, uh, that any additional sources of CP violation are small. Um, this was, the, and, and this is known as the axion quality problem. Um, and th there is a, there, there is a literature on that. Um, yeah, there yeah. is a literature on that. Okay, now one more question. Last question was from Sandeep one, and now this question is from Patrick. Uh, could the fluctuation in axions in sub Hubble scale be large enough so that they can form primordial black hole? So, um, so the fluctuations in the axion field um, in scenario, so in this scenario, in the scenario I'm just talking about right now, scenario B, the fluctuations in the axion field of these signs are curvature perturbations, and they generally have to be small. They have to be small on scales that are observed in the CMB. However, there are um, cases where you can have blue, very blue tilt isocurvature perturbations. So that means that the scales that we see in the CMB um, are nearly scale invariant. But if there's an event during inflation that can cause the isocurvature perturbations have a blue tilt, and then those sub Hubble fluctuations can have an increased power and could lead to um, formations of primordial black holes. I know that there are, um, I think Fuminobu Takahashi has written about this um, in some of his collaborators. In scenario A, the sub Hubble fluctuations of the axion field um, are order one in terms of the axion field, but they're not big enough to give rise to primordial black hole formation. In scenario A, they give rise to the, but they do give rise to dense axion structures and we call those mini clusters. So scenario A, you get dense objects, but you don't get black holes and you get axion stars in the center of those and things like that. Um, but you don't get primordial black holes. But scenario B, if you have blue tilt isocurvature perturbations, um, that could happen. Great. So uh, I have one nice question. So once the axon field starts rolling off, till it reaches the minima and starts oscillating coherently, uh, can it gain kinetic energy on the way to the minima so that it depletes its energy uh, a lot? Because you know, a kinetic energy domination phase will deplete mm -hmm. the energy. Yeah, is it possible? Mm. There are, uh, I, I don't see why it's not possible. I don't see a reason why, it, why, it, why it's impossible. Um, there are ways to dilute the energy density and that could, that, that could be one of them. Um, it depends maybe the initial condition of the field. Maybe, where yeah, you if you start the field with a large initial velocity, yeah. um, then of course, it loses energy density, like eight to the minus six, if it has a large initial velocity. Yeah. Um, but then the Hubble friction will eventually take over and cause it to flatten, and then it will oscillate to get, and then it will undergo its oscillations. So, I'm that, talking about after after the Hubble friction when it again starts to roll off. That mm, time is it possible? Well, so yeah, so if if. The, the the initial kinetic energy has not been has not been damped away such that so what you would do is you would come a to the minus six flat oscillate now if the initial kinetic energy is large enough you would never hit that flat phase and there would be more a to the minus six damping okay. um but 
the, the reason I explain, I wanted to think of it this way with a gap is you can think of that then uncertainty on the initial velocity as an uncertainty on the initial field value. So like any uncertainty on the velocity, you can put in as initial field value, value uncertainty. But I do think the case of like, can we get large initial velocities? It is an interesting question. Um, because I don't know what, because it would be a, it would be a very interesting question for axion like particles, like, um, because it's another way of create, well, it's another way of creating kinetian energy density. It's an eighth of the minus six stiff fluid, which you can constrain. Yeah. Um, and it's a way of depleting yeah, any large, init large initial energy density. If you can create an initial velocity, but, Normal, but the spontaneous symmetry breaking, I don't think, gives you an initial velocity. But there, but you could, but you could imagine like other effects, more, um, in, you know, coming from inflation, for example, that could do this. I think it's an interesting question. Okay, great. So there, I see there is no more questions. So thanks, David. Thanks, Dodi, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow then, and you'll cover up the rest of the axioms and. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. So, yeah. Thanks very much. See you tomorrow. Yeah. yeah thanks.